Just so we're clear, everybody, I'm gonna switch back to Liam. This is a game! <laughs> this is a game! Which camera's on me? This is a game! <laughs> That's right, Liam, Dungeons and Dragons is a game. But why stop there? Why stop at just a game when it could be so much more? When it could be this? We traveled into the fucking nine hells to get Pike a suit of armor. We went and battled a city of vampires so Percy could feel good about his name. We fought Goliaths for Grog. We've traveled across planes of existence so you could fix your fucking daddy issues. But you've never done anything for me, ever. You've never risked anything. You don't know me. You don't know anything about me. What's my mother's name? What's her name? Easy question. Died in front of me. Killed by a goblin. Biggest part of my life. What's her name? This is from the show Critical Role, more specifically episode 85, and that character is Scanlan, played by the voice actor slash director Sam Regal. This scene means a lot to me because, well, let's rewind a bit. Who is Scanlan Shorthalt? Oh, you haven't heard of Scanlan Shorthalt? Well, gird your loins, ladies, because he has his eye on you. Alright, alright, Scanlan. For copyright's sake, how about we let me take the wheel on this one? To really get the full scope of this character, we have to go back to the very origin of both his and the game's creation, which traces back to a little podcast called All Work, No Play, created by the aforementioned Sam Regal and Liam O'Brien. The idea of this podcast is, as two very busy working adults and family men, these guys needed an excuse to step away from that schedule and do something fun every once in a while. Which brings us to episode 2, where they announce that they'll be playing a game of Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Mastered by the voice actor Matthew Mercer. Well, Liam had played D&D in the past as a kid and was quick to pick a half-elf rogue as his character, but Sam had a perception of D&D that probably most people have. We're going back to the 80s, <laughs> and we're no. playing D&D &D with a group of dudes with maybe and one, girls. Maybe one actual girl, which would really lend a lot of validation. It's true, although this. it wouldn't be an authentic experience. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we wouldn't have. So Sam has a vague idea in mind for his character. Make the quote-unquote worst. Right. So help me choose my character. Can I just be the worst? What's the worst? I'll be the, <laughs> the worst. worst character. Well, Is that be like, like a, a gnome? Okay, I am a gnome, of course. Then you have to pick a class. A class. Bards play, they'll, you'll have like a lute or a mandolin, <laughs> and you'll play Do it. Do I fight with this thing? Eh, occasionally, but more you strum your guitar, and it inspires us all and gives us bonuses for our attacks or makes us feel better. Thus, our gnome bard was born. This group of voice actors consisting of Laura Bailey, Travis Willingham, Ashley Johnson, Taliesin Jaffe, Orion Akaba, Marisha Ray, and of course Liam and Sam made up the group Vox Machina, a band of fantasy heroes who would eventually go on to save the world. It was a long time before these characters ever came to our home screens outside of the odd 7 second recording to pop up on one of the players' social media, but eventually the group was approached by the company Geek & Sundry who wanted to produce the D&D game live on their Twitch channel. With years having passed at this point, Scanlan became more than just the worst character, but that continued to at least partially shape who he was intrinsically. He was comedic relief. His gnomish stature, his phallic motif, and the bardic tendency to sing all lent itself to being the lighter half of a game that could, to put it lightly, get quite dark. Percy and Vax, uh, you guys notice the figure on the far left. Um, the body. The, the, body on the body on the far left has a, uh, uh, like a red paint smattered across its face and its arms. Immediately to the left of it, you see what looks to be the body of a child. The child is uh, dressed up in a purple-ish billowing uh, shirt, a very fine silk shirt. You see what appears to be a, uh, another woman dressed in dark blacks and browns, leathers, some furs across the top, dark hair, dangling. To the left of that, you see another man dressed similarly, dark grays and blacks, long dark hair, Dangling to the left of that, you see uh, this figure is actually not humanoid. It appears to have been uh, oh my god a recently hunted bear that is dangling. No 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 no, no 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 no. Wait what? It's us. They killed people they thought were us, or or they killed. Or it's a message. Or it's a message to us. I present to you Sam Regal.
It can be a good thing to be the funny guy. I mean, every group of friends has one. The guy who always has a joke. He's always riffing on a bit. It's a talent to make people laugh. But that label can be a double-edged sword. I don't think it's a stretch to say that oftentimes the people who are funniest happen to have developed that skill as a defense mechanism. Go to any Jewish comedian and they'll make fun of their nose, speak to an Asian one and they'll joke about squinting eyes, talk to Scanlon Shorthalt and he'll tell you about his one-inch penis. I, I check under below my belt because the spell has worn off and I'm back down to my normal one and a half inches. <laughs> Length and girth. Oh god, what? It's like a square. Yeah, you're like, yes. It's like a cube. You're like a I very slowly and sultrily unbuckle my armor. <laughs> let, let one strap fall, let the other strap fall. Just do a little shimmy and let very... it fall to the ground. Oh, and it's just, oh, there's oh, nothing oh, underneath. It's just me and the cube. <laughs> <laughs> and I cry a little. <laughs> cube, glorious cube. <laughs> You really should try it. <laughs> if you're in the mood, I won't even hide it. <laughs> I'll pull down my trousers for any gal or dude. Oh, cube, glorious cube, wonderful cube, magical cube. <laughs> I'd like to put into perspective what 85 episodes means. This is well over 250 hours of broadcasting. That's roughly equivalent to all 720 episodes of Naruto. It's about six times the length of Breaking Bad, and it's only 73% of the first campaign of the show. Those are rough calculations, but the point is, that is a lot of time. Specifically, it's a lot of time for Scanlan to have been stewing on his place as a member of Vox Machina, a group of highly trained warriors. Let's put a pin in this conversation for a minute because I want to talk about another character. Dungeons and Dragons Dragons is a game, yes, but more so than anything, it is storytelling. The rules and mechanics of the game are there to make your lives as storytellers easier. It tells us how much damage a longsword does so we don't have to stop the momentum of story and calculate some sort of formula. Earlier I had said that Liam created a half-elf rogue. That character's name is Vaxeldon, and he has one of my favorite moments in the entire show. It happens in episode 25 at about 40 minutes in. To set the stage, the party of Vox Machina have attended a feast in celebration of a political alliance between two cities. But Vox Machina has their hesitations about one of these attending families. Specifically, they have reason to believe that they're super duper evil and killed one of the player's entire family. Call it a hunch. So while a majority of Vox Machina is attending this banquet, one of the characters, Vaxeldon, who going forward will be called Vax, has decided to sneak his way through the castle and dig up some info on this family. Long story short, he gets caught, and he gets attacked, and he goes down. But just unconscious, not dead. Let's review how dying works in D&D. So you have hit points, let's say Vax had 90 or so. Let's say he gets stabbed with a dagger. The dagger does 1d4 damage, plus the attacker's dexterity bonus, looking at roughly 3-9 to nine points of damage. Depending on who's hitting him, Vax could take a fair amount of those before falling, but when he does eventually hit zero, he has to start making death saving throws. This basically means every round of combat he rolls a 20 sided die, and if it's a 10 or above, he passes. If it's a 9 or lower, he fails. If he passes 3 times, he is unconscious but stabilized, if he fails 3 times, he dies. Minus resurrection magic, that is basically all there is to death in this game. It's a couple dice rolls and then you're either in or you're out. But that's not what happens here. Vax is not dead yet, but isolated with enemies in front of him and unconscious, he fears that he might be dead soon. In this moment, Liam O'Brien pauses the game. And this happens. So well, we're heading to the room. As Wait. The, the turns happen. Wait. As that happens, and as my consciousness fades away, <laughs> I don't say anything, but here's what I think in a split second. Okay. okay? Think of my friends that I've spent so much time with. I think of Keyleth, beautiful, walking under the trees. I think of my twin sister as a young girl, folding the linens with our mother. I think of my sister as an adolescent in lessons, smarter than me. I think of the woman that she grew into, hiking over many, many, many miles together. My best friend, my best friend, Exalia. And 
before I can think no more, I say a prayer to Saren Ray to watch over my friends and keep them safe. This is one of my favorite moments because the book has no section on a dying breath. It has no rules for how long your monologue can be before you pass out. But Liam and everyone at that table are good storytellers. They go beyond the medium of the game they're playing and choose to instead deliver on an amazingly emotional scene. In this group we have Percival, a member of the once prestigious Dorolo family, a surname smeared in blood as they were deceived and killed by vampires called the Briarwoods. We have Vexalia, a bastard of elven royalty and an impoverished human. Her mother died at the hands of an ancient red dragon, we watch her struggle to learn of her own worth as her memory is plagued by the scornful looks of the high and mighty elves. We have Keyleth, the naive and socially inept prodigy of her tribe. We follow her as she makes her journey through her culture's trials and takes steps into becoming the leader that her people need. And then we have Scanlan, who does this. Yes. I'm gonna sing... Your evilness is killing me, and I, I must confess, I want to flee. I, I want, want to flee. flee. <laughs> but when you see me, you lose your mind. Baby, it's a sign. Pitfin, baby, now you're mine. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Scanlan, we all do, but in the presence of people like Vox Machina, how can you blame someone for feeling inadequate? When in a situation like that, suddenly the label of funny guy becomes a curse. You start to think, is that all I am? Am I just a joke to these people? Does anyone actually like me, or do they just like that I make them laugh? And these thoughts, they build and build until finally you explode. And that's exactly what happens. What? You think you care about me? Yeah. Yes, asshole, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, you're right. You like me, because I make jokes. And I play songs, and I give you a warm place to stay at night, and I feed you fucking chicken, and I heal you in battle. But you don't really care about me, come on. Grog has Pike. Vax has Keyleth. Percy has Vex. But Scanlan has no one, and I had one chance at one real relationship with my daughter, and I feel like you gone and fucked it up too because you don't really know me and you don't really know what my relationship is with her or what I promised her or anything really. And it's fine. When I met you all, I was just, I was just a, a funny little man playing songs and that's all I'll ever really be. And that's okay, because I can take care of myself. On the Critical Role subreddit, a certain topic comes up relatively frequently, and that's can we get Critical Role as a TV show? It makes sense as a request. It's a serialized drama, the players are all actors, people love it, the connection is there to make. But I don't necessarily know if that would work. Which is not to say that it wouldn't, just that there is merit to the idea of a difference in mediums. It's not always possible to just make a movie into a TV show or vice versa. At the very least, it's not that simple. And I'm not sure that the story of Vox Machina is 100% translatable. But what I do know is that you'd be hard pressed to ignore the fact that this show show does have qualities of great writing, and a lot of that credit needs to go to Matthew Mercer for being an incredible dungeon master. The player is all constructed fully dimensioned and layered characters that are fascinating to watch unfold, but the person who weaved the narrative is him. Here's a simple tip to any aspiring DMs out there. Patience goes a long way. Before I explain what I mean, I want to show a clip to you. Remember this clip, because we're going to revisit it a couple times. I know a lot has happened these recent months, I've been watching from afar keeping tabs on your journey best that I can. But I still know so little. Some time has passed, Vax. And much of the world moves on to newer, greater threats. But true pain never really heals. He turns to you. Steps up to you, looking you close in the face. You hurt me deeply. You continue to hurt. Agony. For weeks. Months. Pain I had never experienced. It's all I can think about. Can I make an inside check? You would if you had time. As suddenly you look down, and there is Gilmore holding a blade thrust into your stomach. Your robe is now beginning to fill with crimson red around the wound. 
It's that moment you see him pull you in and stare into your face with a very, very low growl. It's all I think about. And you watch as a flicker to his form happens and you see for a second there's a flash, not skin, but fur. You see teeth, you see whiskers, and the hand holding the dagger is facing the other direction. Let's play a game. How many layers of depth can we add to this scene? Let's rewind the clock back to 2015, where some of Vox Machina, through a series of events, find themselves facing off against a Rakshasa. This is layer one. But what is a Rakshasa? Page 257 of the 5th edition Monster Manual says that Rakshasas originated long ago in the Nine Hells. A Rakshasa enters the material plane to feed its appetite on humanoid flesh and evil schemes. It selects its prey with care, taking pains to keep its presence in the world a secret. Few creatures ever see the fiend in its true form, for it can take on any guise at once. A Rakshasa's true form combines the features of a human and a tiger, with one noteworthy deformity. Its palms are where the back of the hands would be on a human. On top of that, the creature has access to some nifty spells, including Dominate Person, Plane Shift, True Seeing, and Invisibility. All in all, this tiger created a formidable foe. Vox Machina, specifically Vax and Keyleth, were tasked by a local guild of monster hunters to track this Rakshasa down, kill it, and scavenge it for organs, which they did. But that brings in another interesting aspect to this creature. The Rakshasa is a fiend like a devil. And like a devil, they cannot be killed permanently unless killed in the Nine Hells. Any form of destruction on the material plane is simply a temporary death until they are reborn back in their home. Oh, and another note, they remember. This fiend will come back for the one who killed it, which is this man right here. Layer 2. The Rakshasa is a challenge rating of 13. Challenge ratings are basically a formula of quantifying how powerful a monster is. A rating of 13 means that 4 player characters at the level of 13 would consider this monster a fair fight. At the time, this was somewhat appropriate. It's the 21st episode, they had 5 players, all around level 11, the Rakshasa was a fitting opponent. However, his return would not happen until episode 58, and at this point, our party was now around level 14. Not only that, but we weren't looking at 5 players, now there were 7. This monster was was out of its depths at this point. So what does Matt Mercer do? Does he just throw a random low-level encounter at the party and let that build up of 30 plus episodes go to waste? No. At this time in the show, we were in the Chroma Conclave arc. This arc would last a very long time and would occupy the minds of the players for months. What happened was a group of very powerful, very old dragons banded together to take over the world. Dragons that were far too strong for Vox Machina to take down immediately. Most of this arc was spent recruiting allies, searching for new items, and leveling up. And during this time, the party created a safe haven in a city called Whitestone. Using very powerful magic lent by some allied mages, they camouflaged all of Whitestone and its population from the eyes of the Conclave. In episode episode 57, Vox Machina had just defeated one of the dragons and made their way back to their safe haven, looking to recuperate after a perilous battle. This is when the Rakshasa would strike. The fiend was clever. He snuck his way into the city, using the cataclysmic backdrop of ancient dragons flying in the air as cover. He isolated Vax alone at night while the rest of the party slept. He disguised himself as an ally, tricking Vax into taking his armor off and instead wearing a special robe. Then he did this. Some time has passed, Vax and much of the world moves on to newer, greater threats. But true pain never really heals. Pain I had never experienced. It's all I can think about. Can I make an inside check? You would if you had time, as suddenly you look down and there is Gilmore holding a blade thrust into your stomach. It's all I think about. And you watch as a flicker to his form happens and you see for a second there's a flash, not skin, but fur. You see teeth, you see whiskers, and the hand holding the dagger is facing the other direction. At this point in the story, the Rakshasa is not a challenging opponent to Vox Machina. In fact, even with the handicap in his favor, he was still disposed of. But this moment of cunning, this moment of trickery and facade, a climax of over 35 episodes of build-up, nearly a full year in the making, was iconic. But that's only two layers. There is a third one here. The Rakshasa had to disguise himself as an ally to get to Vax, and he did so by becoming an NPC named Gilmore. Gilmore has existed for a very long time. He was a favorite of the players before Critical Role even began as a live stream, and Gilmore loves Vaxeldon. The two had a very flirtatious relationship with each other. Pushing through the beaded curtain you see before you, the bead of sweat on his head, Gilmore. <laughs> 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 I'm so glad you came back. <laughs> Gilmore! Gilmore! I walk up to him, take him by the head, give him a good European-style kiss, just about here, right there. <laughs> 
come back and say, there is so much to talk about. <laughs> oh yes, there Where is. Where can we be alone? But something interesting happened with Vaxeldon early on in the show when the party had a bit of a spur in a different plane called the Underdark. Liam has gone on record as not remembering the exact moment that sparked it, but sometime while Vox Machina was down there, Vax began to catch feelings for fellow party member Keyleth, played by Marisha Ray. This led to quite the long arc of character development as Vaxeldon slowly fell deeper and deeper and eventually would lead to one of the very first in-game relationships. But that's a different topic for a different video. What's important for this video is that it led to this conversation right here. We, we have known each other a long time. Long yeah. time, yeah? I have a lot of love for you. You are an amazing man. No, I'm not disagreeing with you there. <laughs> There's no question you and I have danced around each other a bit for the past few years. And... I have been curious. But I respect you very much. And I need to tell you that I can't do the dance anymore. I am in love with someone I don't think loves me, but all the same, it wouldn't be fair to you to think that we might dally, and I don't want to be a liar, so I won't be. Well, I would be lying if I didn't say I was a little disappointed. But at the same time, the heart wants what the heart wants. Truly heartbreaking for all hopeful shippers, and this moment would continue to dwell on the mind of Vax. For, for a long time, and I said this at some point like six months ago, that his biggest regret was disappointing Gilmore. Vax always had that bead in the back of his head saying, you led Gilmore on, you hurt him. And to have that little notion constantly chipping at your thoughts, only to then be met face to face with the man and have him repeat the very statement back to you, that moment would feel, well, it would feel like a knife being plunged and twisted into your gut. You hurt me deeply. It continued to hurt. Agony for weeks, months, pain I had never experienced. It's all I can think about. Can I make an inside check? You would if you had time. Intricate, layered storytelling is a featured quality of Critical Role, this being but one example. In a past video, I'd briefly touched on the question of what makes art bad. I talked about the idea of a collective, or majority, of opinions and how I believe the foundation of analysis to be pattern recognition. When I analyze, I am merely acknowledging the history of acclaimed art and applying certain trends to other things, a fairly simple and innocuous exercise. But in a monologue from Ratatouille, the character Anton Ego says, But there are times when a critic truly risks something, and that is in the discovery and defense of the new. Now, I am not so self-indulgent to say that I am risking my career by going on the train of Critical Role. I am most definitely not that important. But Dungeons & Dragons as a show is new. Sure, technically Acquisitions Incorporated has existed for a decade, and Chris Perkins' The Dungeon Master experience could kinda be considered a form of storytelling, but neither of these can match up to the sheer production rate and size of Critical Role. And it's in being new that there lies difficulty in looking at this critically. I have no large source pool to pull from in comparing it. I don't have a plethora of Dungeon Masters to observe and analyze against, but I firmly believe that Critical Role has started a trend here. I don't know if 30 years from now we'll be able to look back on the show as being as brilliant as I look at it now, but I do know that, for the time being, there's nothing that I enjoy more than tuning in on a Thursday night and watching a bunch of nerdy-ass voice actors sit around and play Dungeons and Dragons. Hey, thanks for watching this video. I know fan art is a very prominent piece of the Critical Role fandom, and while this isn't a drawing or painting, I put a lot of work into it, so if you enjoyed it, I'd appreciate you giving a like or maybe even sharing it around. It'd be awesome if anyone from the cast saw this. But I also want to say a quick thank you to our patrons over at patreon.com slash k2yt. Specifically, Michael Lane, Wazane Mufunde, Mr. Idealist, Danny the Donkey, Gage Lambert, Doji, and Calliope. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you again, and see you guys soon.